Hi everyone, this is the third video in this little introduction to abstract algebra and groups, namely part three, finite groups. The one, the last thing that I want to show you uh, that I find actually one of the most fun things in math for me is everything that we've looked at so far applies to, we've only been looking at, uh, we've only been looking at infinite groups, the um, integers, the positive rationals, uh, the two by two matrices, and so on, right? Those are all infinite. But the really cool thing is that finite groups don't have to be infinite. This is where things really break away from uh, where we started, from our concrete number systems, and they get crazy. And it's this that leads ultimately uh, to its finite groups are what Galois started looking at when he proved that uh, there is no um, formula to solve um, quintic equations, meaning polynomials of, uh, of degree five. Uh, you, you, there's no standard solution. There might be a solution, but you can't solve every solution just using uh, uh, of every fifth degree polynomial using um, uh, just rational numbers. And, um, and secondly, uh, Galois, everything that Galois figured out is hugely important to our ultimate proof of Fermat slash theorem. Because if you remember from the first video we did, uh, Wiles is talking about Galois representations when he talks about different modular forms in different elliptic curves. This is what he's getting at. It's, it's what Galois found, figured out about finite groups that led him to his solutions and then is what is ultimately going to matter for us in proving that, uh, that Fermat's last theorem is true. Because, because of the structure involved here, the structure is rigid enough that it doesn't allow for certain things to be the way you want them to be. That's basically what the, what the proof is. That's how, he, that's how Galois proved that, that there's no solutions here. Um, so the first finite group, just to give you an understanding of it, uh, very, the classic thing, you've probably seen this before, um, a clock. Uh, this is the, the sort of typical example of a finite group because if you start at 10 and you add 5 to 10, you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you end up at 3. So if you're talking in time, 10 plus 3, or I'm sorry, 10 plus 5 doesn't equal 15, it equals 3, okay? If you start at 5 and you add 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, you get 1. So 5 plus 8 equals one, okay? It's a finite group. It's also cyclical, which we're not gonna talk about much, but uh, it's not just clocks, it's um, the integers modulo uh, any number, any integer, um, form one of these cyclic groups. So what this is, the n is you just divide through with the integers. So for instance, uh, z, uh, mod 3 equals 0, 1, 2. You're just dividing through by 3. So what that means is if you're looking, so again, in, in the integers module mod 3, let's say that you uh, take 2 and add 2 to it, you end up with 4. But what you do then is just divide four by three and you have one left over. So this is your answer, right? And if you, so the answer is one. So if you think about it in this way, this is two, this is zero. Oh wait, I'm sorry, no, that's wrong, wrong clock, huh? One, two, three, zero, one, two. So you start here, you go around to here and you end up at one. Okay, so that's true if it's, uh, oops, if it's, say, mod 7, then it's, and 
if you take five and you add six to it, you end up with 11, which just means that you divide that by seven and you get four left over. Right? Because you go, you go around past 11 and then you're gonna go four past it. So the remainder is basically the value. That's the, the quintessential example of, of uh, finite groups. Um, what I really love about finite groups, uh, this was my favorite thing when I took, when I took al abstract algebra um, a long time ago, is uh, a good way to look at them is you basically make a multiplication table. So one interesting question is what is the smallest group? Well, actually, the smallest group is E. Oh, E, by, I don't know if I said this, but E is the sort of the um, standard way of talking about a generic um, identity element. You should have picked that up, but I should have said it. Because um, E times E is E, so it has an identity, and so on. E times E times E times E, you always end up in there, it's closed, and so on. Is there a group with two elements? Yes. So we can make a table. Now we know there has to be an identity element. That's one of the um, that's one of the properties. So e times e has to be e. E times a has to be a, and a times e has to be a. So the question is then, what is uh, a times a going to be? Well, remember. Every element has to have an inverse. So that means you have to be able to, there has to be some number that you multiply by a to get you back to the identity. That has to be itself. So a times a must take you back to e. So this is the, uh, this is the two element group. And the, the most, the coolest thing about it, it's the only two element group. There's no other way of doing this. So there's only one two element group. What about three? So we start with uh, the identity, and then we'll just use A and B. So we start E times anything has to be itself, same thing. So you always start this way. And once you start that way, it really uh, limits what you can do. So what happens so there's a couple more properties that spring out of, of this. And one of them is uh, each column is going to have to have each element once and nothing can repeat itself. So um, we could try to put the E's here like we did up here, but then we're stuck because this can't be B because we already have a B. It can't be A because we already have an A. So this won't work. So there's only one other way to do it, E, A, B. If E can't go there, it has to go there. And then each column needs one of each, and each row needs one of each, so it has to go there. So we have A's, we don't have a B. We have B's, we don't have an A. So. This is the only three element group. Another interesting thing is you can tell instantly whether a group is um, abelian, commutative, by whether it is symmetrical across, the, across this diagonal. And you can see that this is. This one's abelian, this one's abelian, and it turns out that uh, every cyclical group uh, Isabellian, I think. The primary ones are, I think they all are. Um, so now I'm just gonna do a couple more. Um, what about four elements? It starts getting more interesting here. So we can, we have E, A, B, C. E, A, B, C. Always start with the multiplied by the identity. Now, 
there's a couple ways we can do this. We can either put E here, or we could put something else here. So we could put E, I'm gonna do, do it twice. Or we can put something else, which would mean either B or C. In this case, it doesn't matter, it's arbitrary because you can always rearrange the rows and columns, so we'll just say B. So now can we fill in the rest of the, can we fill in the rest of it? Um, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, this will be something for you to play with on your own, but basically we could put the E's here, but if we do that, you can rearrange it and it basically uh, becomes, or I think if we do that, it becomes um, isomorphic with uh, the one here. So it's basically the equivalent to the one here. So the only other way then is if the E's are straight down the diagonal. So let's see if we can, if we can fill it in this way. So we have A here, a B there, so this has to be C, this has to be B. Uh, we have an A, we have a B, so this has to be C. This has to be B, this has to be A, and this has to be A. Okay, that's one. If we do this, then we can put, uh, I'm just gonna fill this in. Um, so this is A, B, we need a C, and then this has to be E. So that's gonna have to be E, and then uh, this will be C, this will be A, and that'll be A. These two groups are not the same. They're not isomorphic. You cannot rearrange the rows to make one equal the other. This one has two identities. This one has four. So this is the first example. They're both, they're still commutative. This is the first example where we have two different four element groups. And I'm not gonna go into any more detail about what the difference is, but one is basically uh, cyclical. Um, and one is basically two smaller circles. They go, they, it, it goes, they go back. You go out and back with each element. Um, so this is again, first out, first time with four elements. Now there's two possible structures. And I believe this is, it's the existence of this group is what made, allowed Galois to prove what he was trying to prove, that there are limits to the um, quintic uh, polynomials over the field of rationals. Um, five is uh, another prime, which means that uh, it's cyclical, it's another clock, and it turns out that all the primes are clocks. All right, that is the end to part three, uh, a little bit about finite groups. So we're almost done. I made one more video, which is just going through an example, uh, the dihedral group of order six, and it will be next in line, and then we'll be done with this introduction to groups. Okay, here is the link to the first video in this chapter. Here is the link to the previous video. Here is the link to the next video, and click here to subscribe, and please join me on Patreon. The link to that is below in the description. Thank you.